Thank you, Mark. Um, let me just preface my remarks by saying that this is a, a little more detailed version of the short uh, account that Steve gave in his opening remarks about the fact that this is uh, the Alabama uh, World War Memorial. Um, and if you want the full version, I'll put in a plug for the anthology that Marty Olaf uh, edited and put together. The longer, fuller version of the story is, is in Marty's anthology. In February 1919, three months after World War I ended, Alabama became the first state to pass legislation to create a statewide memorial to those who fought in the Great War. The law established the Alabama Memorial Commission and directed it to raise funds for a memorial. The commissioners soon launched a $500,000 campaign for memorial building on the state capitol grounds that would house a state agency, the Department of Archives and History. Despite the state's early start, the project stalled and was not completed until 1940, as you learned earlier today, when the nation was on the brink of another world war. At the dedication of the building, this building we're in now, in late 1940, the archivist of the United States, R.D.W. Connor, paid tribute to Thomas Owen, who founded the nation's first state archives in 1901 and served as, his direct, as its director until his death in 1920. Connor described this building as, quote, the capstone of Dr. Owen's work and noted that it was, quote, his inspiration in the initial stages of the project that brought it to a successful conclusion. Now, even though the south portico of this building bears the inscription, Alabama World War Memorial, most Alabamians today, I would guess, would not identify the structure as a memorial commemorating World War I. Instead, it's known as the State Archives Building or the Archives and History Building, and only incidentally as the World, Alabama's World War Memorial. Now, overlooking the State Archives uh, Building's commemorative role as a war memorial is nothing new. Perhaps the best evidence of, that the building lacked memorial status from the outset comes from a paper on the Capitol grounds by Algernon Blair, who Marty mentioned uh, in relation to uh, Camp Sheridan earlier. Blair was a prominent businessman and contractor, well known throughout the state, and he read a paper in 1943 at a meeting of prominent Montgomerians on the Capitol complex. His description of the development of the complex included a detailed account of the design and construction of this building. But nowhere in his 29-page paper, 29 paper did Blair refer to the structure as Alabama's World War I memorial. Instead, he simply called it, like everybody else, the Archives and History Building. Now, such an oversight by a prominent state figure suggests that probably from the outset, the building was not widely recognized as the state's memorial to the Great War. Now, to some Alabamians who opposed the idea, the building's failure to attain memorial status was not an unexpected development. Immediately after the creation of the Memorial Commission, some began to criticize the idea of a building rather than a monument to honor the fallen. One critic asked pointedly, is there anything in a building that we can associate with the memory of our soldiers? Nevertheless, the proponents of a memorial building project proceeded under Owen's leadership, but achieving their goals was indeed difficult and slow. In addition to the complaints of critics, they encountered fundraising problems. A depressed agricultural economy and weariness from the sacrifices of the war meant that many Alabamians were unable or unwilling to donate to the cause. Moreover, Owen's sudden death in 1920 at age 53 def deprived the project of dynamic leadership and it lost momentum. And although his successors continued the campaign, they raised scarcely a tenth of the half million dollar goal. They subsequently lobbied for state funding, but the onset of the Great Depression any ended any hope of securing dollars for the project. The first proposal that Alabama's war memorial should take the form of a building came from a wartime agency, the Alabama Council of Defense. The council's final report recommended a, quote, memorial building of enduring usefulness to keep alive the records and exploits of those sons of Alabama who made the supreme sacrifice. Although the report did not specifically call for a structure to house the state archives, the intent was clear. And Owen served on the council in his capacity as state war historian and almost certainly had a hand in shaping the recommendation. The Council of Defense's call for a building rather than a monument reflected a broader national trend of so-called, quote, living memorials. 
Proponents of living memorials argued that traditional monuments would lose their significance to subsequent generations. Instead, they advocated creating a facility, a building, a stadium, a park that not only honored the fallen, but also served the needs of the living. One important manifestation of this idea was a national campaign for erecting memorial structures that could serve as center to centers for community life. Shortly after the war's end, a group of 100 men and women formed the National, memorial, national Committee on Memorial Buildings to foster a, a national movement to construct community buildings as war memorials. And I might add that General Pershing supported this, uh, this idea. By early 1919, some 400 cities and towns uh, reported plans to erect community buildings as war, more war memorials. But enthusiasm for these liberty buildings, as they were sometimes called, was not universal. In January 1919, the American Federation of Arts issued its recommendations for war memorials. Regarding memorial buildings, the Federation acknowledged that they could serve as suitable memorials, but noted that a structure which is, quote, entirely utilitarian cannot satisfy the desire for a commemorative work of art. The Federation showed a clear pre preference for monumental memorials, such as fountains, gateways, and tablets. And it noted that effective commemorative structures, such as the Lincoln Memorial, are devoid of practical utility. I'm quoting from their uh, uh, report. They are devoid of practical utility, but they minister to a much higher use." Unquote. If memorial planners, the Federation continued, should insist on a utilitarian structure, the Federation cautioned that it, quote, must impress the beholder by beauty of design, the permanent nature of the material used, and the fitness of the setting, end quote. Now, although the, the idea of a liberty building had its critics, an influential cadre of state officials had clearly embraced the concept in Alabama and began to move decisively ahead with the idea. In late February, the governor organized the Memorial, Alabama Memorial Commission, consisting of 17 members, five ex officio, and 11 appointed by the governor. Owen was the only ex officio member who was not an elected official. And a testament not only to his interest in the project's potential to create a facility for his agency, but also to his gravitas as a respected and influential figure in state government. He had directed the archives since its founding in 1901. He had served on at least two other commissions authorized by the state legislature, and he was known as someone who knew how to get things done in state government. Born in 1866, Owen had earned a law degree in 1887. By the early 1890s, however, he had developed a passion for Alabama history that soon eclipsed his legal career. In 1893, he married Marie Bankhead, daughter of John Hollis Bankhead, an experienced politician who would later become a leading member of Alabama's congressional delegation. Marie's brothers would later become influential leaders in Congress during the Roosevelt administration, and her niece Tallulah added glamour to the Bankhead name. In short, Owen married into one of the most politically influential families in the state of Alabama. In early 1919, the outgoing governor urged the legislature to create just such a commission as had been recommended. A week later, the newly inaugurated governor, Thomas Kilby, addressed the legislature and likewise urged the lawmakers to act. Two weeks later, the legislature indeed approved a bill to create the Alabama Memorial Commission. The act appropriated $50,000 of state money toward the memorial, contingent on the commission raising at least $200,000 from private donations. Additionally, the act appropriated $10,000 immediately to underwrite the cost of a fundraising campaign. At its organizational meeting, the commission set an ambitious goal of raising a half million dollars, equivalent to over six million today. The commissioners decided to focus their fundraising efforts on both the schools and the public at large. They designated May 9th, 1919 as, quote, Memorial Building Day in the schools. They hoped to convince school administrators to hold patriotic programs that would encourage students to donate. And anticipating a wave of patriotic fervor when Alabamians celebrated their first Independence Day after the uh, war's end, they designated June 27th through July 4th, 1919 as the week to rally state public support and contributions. 
Literature distributed by the Commission advised that all inquiries about the project should be addressed to Owen, who served as the Secretary for the Commission. On April 3rd, 1919, the Commission approved a resolution that specified that the memorial would indeed take the form of a building on the Capitol grounds in Montgomery to, and it would house the State Archives. Now in the weeks between the Commission's organizational meeting in February and the April 3rd resolution, they had held various public meetings to hear the views of the public regarding the, the uh, proposed war memorial. The most significant opposition to a memorial building came from those who promoted a memorial hospital for veterans and their families. Despite strong statewide sentiment for a hospital, the commissioners rejected the idea, citing an attorney general's opinion that the Alabama Memorial Commission did not have the legal authority to build a hospital as a memorial. When hospital supporters continued to aggressively lobby for the, the initiative, Owen confident, confidently advised his fellow commissioners to, quote, ignore the whole matter from whatever quarter the agitation may come. Having stood firm in this, on its decision regarding the nature and purpose of the memorial, the Commission moved quickly to establish a framework for launching the fundraising campaign. In anticipation of the summer campaign to the public, they recruited a chairman for each county. Sometimes ind individuals approached had reservations about committing themselves to a statewide effort in the face of their community's interest in a local memorial. For example, one individual in Escambia County was reluctant to serve as a, as a chairman because of, quote, strong sentiment here for erecting a memorial to the boys from this county. But some county chairmen took up the work with the of, of the campaign with great enthusiasm. The Colbert County Commissioner, or chairman rather, uh, reported that he would raise the quota of $6,132 by July 4th, even though he had, quote, met with some opposition among men of prominence whose support I expected. <coughs> Although Colbert County met its goal, despite local opposition, the situation was decidedly different in other counties. At the beginning of June, the Clark County chairman warned Owen of problems uh, uh, competing with the churches. In the wake of the war, the churches had launched their own campaigns, and some ministers apparently were telling their members to put donations to the church first and let the others go. By early July, he reported that Clark County will indeed fall short because the local economy was severely depressed. Quoting from this county chairman, crops are the poorest that we've seen in years. In some sections of this county, especially on the rivers, the, the farmers will, har will hardly make anything. I do not think we can count on more than $3,000 from this county. Conditions are awful. The situation was much the, sh the same in another part of the state, in Franklin County. J. Mason Douglas, an attorney in the county, wrote Governor Kilby an impassioned six-page letter urging postponement of the campaign. Douglas noted that he had served two years as an army officer and spent nine months in France until wounds sent him home. Thus, he wrote, he, quote, yielded to no one in state pride or respect for the splendid accomplishments of Alabama soldiery, end quote. Nevertheless, he maintained that the current campaign is, quote, ill-timed and will be a burden on the people. He told Kilby that Franklin County had, quote, gone over the top in every wartime campaign, including five government drives, the Red Cross, War Work, Armenian Fund, Salvation Army Drives, and the Methodist Centenary Drive. And now comes this drive, one of the noblest in purpose and close to the heart of our people in its sanctity of feeling, but coming at a most inopportune time, end quote. He went on to explain that the financial situation in his county was dire. Mines were closed, farmers were in danger of financial ruin because of heavy rains that had flooded crops in the river bottoms and prevented planting and tilling in other areas. Moreover, Douglas continued, the people of Franklin County had reservations about the project. According to Douglas, they, quote, do not understand what this memorial is to be. They know, of course, that it is to be a building. But such a memorial does not reach their hearts and imagination. He summed up the problem by reflecting on the purposes of memorials. He kind of lectured the governor here. He said, 
There are two values in memorials. They may be combined or they may be separate. One is sentimental, the other practical. In the eyes of the average man, the present memorial form does not assume either. It is too much of an administrative building to serve a sentimental value and too remote from everybody, save a few, to serve a practical value. I wish that all buildings of the state, regardless of their purpose, might be held in respect in the respect with which the Athenians are wont to regard their buildings. But this is not Athens, and our people, rural and remote from Montgomery, fail to understand the matter. And Douglas concluded by urging the governor on behalf of his fallen comrades to postpone the campaign until fall. He said, if the dead could speak, they would not rush the people into a premature plan at a premature time. And speaking as one of the living who has been there, there is no such pressing need for immediate construction as to justify this undue burden upon the people. It is easy to make eulogistic speeches. It is easy to make glorious statements. But wait for better times, for the return of full prosperity, for the return of all our soldiers, and then go forth in sleepless vigilance to secure an unprecedented support from all the people. Well, obviously, the the plan proceeded despite uh, Douglas, uh, Douglas's objections, and Owen replied to critics who questioned the value of a memorial building in the state, in the state capitol, by citing the examples of Westminster Abbey, where he said for hundreds of years all England has turned to as a point of inspiration, and Battle Abbey in Virginia, which, quote, in which thousands of relics of the Civil War are assembled. Like these sites, Owen believed, a war memorial building in Alabama would stand for generations, quote, as an honor to the men of this generation who shared in the great battles for world liberty. Despite Owen's confident rhetoric and his admonitions to persevere, the, cam the campaign nevertheless faltered. The economic situation, weariness over war-related fund drives, skepticism over the idea of a memorial building all proved quite daunting. But perhaps the most damaging blow was Owen's sudden death. Throughout 1919 and the early months of 1920, Owen had worked tirelessly to raise the funds for the project. He told one county chairman that he was incredibly busy because most of the Alabama Memorial Commission's work fell to him. Nevertheless, he said, I am, quote, willing to sacrifice everything for it. Nine months later, he dropped dead from a heart attack. The loss of his leadership and steady hand crippled the campaign. One week after Owen died, the State Archives Board of Trustees selected his wife, Marie, to succeed him as director. Marie Bankhead Owen, in fact, suffered two devastating losses in March. At the beginning of her month, her father, Senator John Bankhead, had died, and by the end of the month, she was a widow. Despite her losses, or perhaps because of them, she took up the work of her husband with great energy. She struggled to keep the memorial building campaign alive while she was grieving over her losses and adjusting to her new responsibilities as director of a state agency. In 1921, she tried to revive the funding campaign, but by 1924, she had abandoned hope that the effort would succeed. She subsequently placed her hopes in state government and told one county chairman that state funding for the project had the support of the governor and the legislature. She confidently asserted that, quote, the building will absolutely be erected at no distant date as it is the memorial due to Alabamians who made such heroic sacrifices. Unfortunately, Marie's confidence was misplaced, for no appropriation came out of the 1924 session. Once again, hope loomed large in 1927 when a bill was introduced to appropriate funds for, for a memorial building, but it did not pass. Hopes that the state would fund construction of the building perished with the onset of the Great Depression. And the year 1935 brought a new governor to Montgomery, Bib Graves, who won with the support of a coalition of liberals, labor, and New Dealers. Graves quickly tapped into New Deal funding and launched a major building program for the Capitol Complex. By the 1930s, Marie's brothers, John and William Bankhead, who held, by then held influential positions in Congress and were key allies of President Roosevelt, uh, by then, that was the situation, and consequently, she was ideally positioned to work with the governor to obtain funding for an archives building, not from private donations, not from the state, 
but from the federal government. So despite the long and failed campaign, despite the long delay, despite the legislature's failure to appropriate funds, Marie persevered, found a way to finish the project her husband had started scarcely a year before his sudden death, and at one level she clearly succeeded. Alabama had its World War I memorial and the state archives had a magnificent facility. But the goal of erecting a memorial through the generous donations of Alabamians who were flushed with patriotism and bursting with pride in the performance of their troop proved elusive. Fund drive fatigue, crop failure, depressed economy, Owen, Thomas Owen's sudden death all conspired against the plan to move quickly after the war and fund the project with private donations. So it's true that Alabama ultimately obtained this magnificent building with the words Alabama World War Memorial engraved in large bold letters on the south portico. But for most Alabamians, I would submit, this building is less a memorial to the Great War and more a home to the state agency entrusted with the noble duty of preserving the state's historical treasures and promoting a better understanding of its history. Perhaps this symposium will bring new life to the idea that this building is indeed Alabama's statewide memorial to the Great War. Thank you.